Hello everyone and welcome to a new episode of F-Secure's podcast Cybersecurity Sauna. My name is Janne Kauhanen and I will be your sauna majori and the host of this podcast. In this show we're bringing you expert views on the hottest topics in the InfoSec game from our corner up north. So welcome to all our listeners and be sure to follow us on Twitter at hashtag Cybersauna. In the past couple of years ransomware stole headlines as the biggest malware threat to worry about. Consumers and businesses alike were being hit and forced to shell out money to retrieve their files. But the cybers never stand still, and neither does malware. Nowadays ransomware is being eclipsed by new trends. Why is that, and what's taking its place? Today we'll find out about crypto jacking and the current world of cybercrime from F-Secure Labs researchers Päivi Tynninen and Jarkko Turkulainen. Welcome to the show, guys. Thanks. Thank you. So ransomware is in decline. How much of a decline, and why is that? Did people stop paying ransomware? So basically, all malware is created because they are after like gaining monetary revenue. The surprising trend that we observed last year that the ransomware was suddenly declining, especially as the market value was estimated to be millions of dollars in 2016. So it was pretty surprising. But the uh, decline partially can be explained by people not paying anymore, as there have been like these public projects of not paying the ransom and uh, Europol's joint effort on No More Ransomware project where they offer these free decryption tools for some ransomware infections. And uh, also the knowledge sharing about like ransomware infections has attributed quite a lot to that people don't necessarily feel victimized when they get attacked by ransomware. So they just ignore the infection? Yeah, and they have like these other measures that they can recover from. For example, they probably have backups or they realize that, okay, ransomware is a potent threat. So they already have like these pre-measures to counteract the ransomware. We've had these three major outbreaks in the last year that probably have attributed also to the overall knowledge that ransomware is a threat, but also that paying up for the ransom, you don't necessarily get your files back. For example, in the first train, uh, wanna cry? It was only wiping your disk and it was encrypting your files in such a manner that they weren't decryptable. So even though people were paying up, none of them got their files back. So that has probably ruined the reputation of ransomware as we had this study in 2016 where we studied the customer service that the ransomware providers were giving and they were really interested in providing good service to their users. And that means that if the user or the customer victim wants to pay the ransom and get their files back, that is possible. So they wanted to provide a really good service for that. Yeah, I mean, presumably they were trying to avoid exactly what happened here, that when people don't get their files back, the incentive to pay up has vanished. Yes, exactly. So in a way, those three major outbreaks have served uh, ransomware business quite a lot of harm. So does that mean that we don't have to worry about ransomware anymore? Absolutely not. Ransomware is still very potent threat. The um, measures users have learned in the past couple of years should still be exercised. So what are the, the current techniques in uh, spreading ransomware? Is it still spam and macros or? Yeah, that's still quite popular, but the currently most prevalent infection vector is brute forcing the target system, for example, via RDP ports and executing the ransomware there manually. So the user doesn't have to do any interactions. And this approach is actually more efficient as it selects only like these high profile targets, such as businesses that have these RDP protocols enabled in their systems. And therefore, it increases the possibility to get a bigger ransom uh, with higher probability to be paid as a company probably needs their intellectual property back. How does that work? Like, are you talking about specific like vulnerabilities in remote desktop protocol or? Only weak credentials and uh, public ports. So they are not like in these contained network segments, but the RDB ports are available in public internet. Okay, and that's not something we recommend. Yeah, especially not. <laughs> In a recent presentation, Paivi, you mentioned that the bait in phishing email is always changing, even though the infection vectors have stayed the same. Can you explain about that a little? Yeah, the spam emails have changed a bit. Even though the infection vector document macros have stayed the same, but the attackers are adding additional layers to avoid automatic analysis and uh, researchers trying to intercept their 
potentially good infections and creating detections for those. For example, the attackers don't necessarily use email attachments anymore, but they are using these links that are these crazy redirect loops that they are redirecting you from page to page. And after like couple to maybe seven different page redirections, you get the final payload, which is only the downloader document with macros. And also another additional security measure or layer that the attackers use is that if they use attachment in an email, they are going to secure it with a password that is attached to the original email. So if you submit this kind of sample to an automatic analysis box, the attachment doesn't execute because it's only prompting for the password that is not available without the original spam email. What's the, uh, the point of, of redirecting you that many times? If you have that many redirection loops, you can always kill one website from that chain so you wouldn't know what the next step was. So if I'm going to follow this kind of infection strain like a couple hours after the campaign is over, I'm not going to be able to deduct from the information I have what was the final payload and what was the executable, what was served. So we are not able to create detections for something that we haven't found. So it's a chain that leads to the attackers, but they're able to cut it at any point. Yes, exactly. So what are the new trends that are taking ransomware's place as a number one malware threat these days? The crypto mining, obviously, is a new trend. And also, uh, I think click fraud is getting bigger, especially on mobile. Maybe phishing kits can be something in the future, a growing trend. We actually see now it's very complex phishing kits that can replicate convincingly big web stores like Walmart. But definitely crypto jacking is the, and crypto mining in general is the absolutely the biggest trend. So what are crypto mining and crypto jacking? Well, the crypto mining in general is this process uh, in which the cryptocurrency is being generated. And at the same time, it runs the whole network of the, of the currency. Crypto jacking is a special technique of that, in that the browser is used to mine cryptocurrency. Okay, so the attackers are using my computer to mine their cryptocurrencies. Yes, basically that's the idea. They take, take over your resources and instead of offering you, for example, a Trojan or, or a ransomware, they use your machine, your CPU cycles, your electricity and transfer that to money. Can you make money that way? Well, obviously it's a profitable business for someone. It's just my understanding of, of crypto mining is that it takes a huge amount of time and ton of resources. So is the attacker going to have that long access to my resources? One of the things that is interesting in this is that they use this um, cryptocurrency called Monero or Monero-based cryptocurrencies. And the interesting feature of that is that you can actually do pretty efficient mining on regular CPUs. So uh, it's not like a Bitcoin where you need to have the GPU. You can mine Monero quite nicely with the current, like a laptop or even mobile phone or, or browser. So imagine if you have a website and 10,000 visitors and they all get this thing, it's going to generate some revenue. Right, so each individual is not doing a lot of the work, but like put together, it's a big deal. Yeah, and then of course on a regular PC, you might run that like 24-7 basically. And if you have a decent botnet running those things, it, it can actually generate. Wouldn't I notice that on my PC that something like that is happening? I don't think so, no. So it's not going to slow my machine down? No, then they usually use like legit tools like XMRig and you can configure those that they use only, for example, one core of your machine or two cores. You don't notice that on regular PC. So how long can an attacker stay on a victim's computer running their crypto mining operation? Basically, if the attack is on a regular PC, on a, like a native platform like Windows, then they usually install the miner and it runs forever, as long as the operating system is up and running. So you might never notice it? No, no. Only if the AV or some other way of removing the malware actually stops the execution, then it just runs there. Is that something that's easy for AV to detect, like malicious crypto mining, as opposed to crypto mining that people are doing on purpose? Mm, not really, because most of the time they use legit tools, like the XM rig, which is used by normal people for mining, making some extra money. So even AV might not be able to catch it? It's not about being able, it's about sometimes we don't want to detect these files because we get so much complaints. But most of the AV actually detects this as a potentially unwanted applications. And then 
if the miner is running on browser, then of course the thing is completely different. It depends on how it is installed. So how is it different on a browser? In general, it runs only when you are on that page. But in some cases, they might install a, like a malicious add-on, for example, for Chrome. Then, of course, it runs whenever the Chrome is up, which is basically nowadays forever. But Google is and other players as well, they are blocking actively these add-ons in their shops. So when did this crypto jacking thing start and what was the catalyst for it? I think the first big case was the Pirate Bay incident in September 2017. So that's when the whole thing broke to the bigger audience. But the development of this JavaScript-based Monero, that was happening behind the scenes already. And the CoinHive was first one to actually come up with working library, maybe in the middle of the 2017 summer. From there on, the process actually took over and it has been kind of big growth there. Are we also seeing like uh, non-criminal instances of crypto mining on people's browsers? I think I've seen like ads being replaced by this. Like we're not going to show you ads. We're just going to mine cryptocurrency on your browser while you're visiting our website. I don't remember the names, but there were some major sites actually using that and still using. So is crypto jacking malware being spread the same way as the traditional payloads? Are there differences? Quite a lot of the crypto mining malware that are targeting for example, Windows platforms, and they are distributed as binaries. They are using the same infection vectors as we saw ransomware in the past couple of years, and that is partially spam. But also, there are these social engineering sites that, for example, you're visiting a trusted legitimate website that has some sort of malicious redirection and it's redirecting you to this uh, pretty shady site that is asking you to install some plugging or browser boosting software that is making your computer usage even quicker, and that could be a coin miner. Is that still malicious banner ads, or what's the technique there? Malvertising, yeah. basically. Well, there's been like a major cases using legit delivery platforms, for example, uh, DoubleClick. So, for example, in January, someone put some obfuscated coin hype scripts using double click and loaded from major sites including youtube wow <laughs> but obviously these are not like a very long living but but still they reach uh, quite many people yeah even if they reach only for a short while and for example youtube probably has millions of visitors in just a couple of minutes that is big enough an audience for coin mining sure yeah and then of course websites they are hacked manually like the normal way so instead of defacing the website, somebody just puts this stuff up. Yeah, and it's very efficient and clean way to do it because traditionally when these people, they take over the servers, they put some iframe to some exploit kit or some other exploitation. And that's very like an unreliable way to take over a machine. You need to also hack the browser. But in this case, you just hack the website, which is much more easy. You always find websites to hack. And then you just put this nice iframe there and that's it. No hacking, no browser crashing and nothing like that. So does this kind of thing primarily affect businesses or consumers or both? I'd say that this affects uh, both consumers and businesses as consumers are a better audience as there are a lot more of them. But the resources that the normal users provide isn't as good as uh, businesses data centers could provide. And we've seen uh, quite a lot of malware strains that are targeting big business corporations and their services and servers, and they are infested with coin miners that are moving laterally from one computer to another. And in a matter of just minutes, you've compromised the whole network. Can I add one more injection vector to this? One very interesting, actually using obviously Wi-Fi hotspots. Someone can just sit on a Wi-Fi and inject something to customers' machines, but also Tor exit nodes. And that's very common. So I've been monitoring Tor exit nodes for quite a while now and, and you get this a lot. And they do SSL striping and all that stuff. So if you're using Tor, you might be mining coins as well. If I have a, a rogue Wi-Fi node or, or uh, I'm running my own malicious Tor exit node, how does that work? I see some unencrypted traffic going through and I... Is that where I get in or...? Yes, and then you just brutally insert the iframe there. It's a one-liner for CoinHive basically. Wow. You mentioned lateral movement that sometimes is needed to spread through an entire organization. Does that happen through like admin tools or 
malicious means like eternal blue or something like that? There are quite a lot of different options for lateral movements, but I think the most popular methods for that are these uh, harvesting used credentials inside the network, such as Mimikatz, and uh, these big exploits such as Eternal Blue using these well-known vulnerabilities, especially in business environments. Let's talk a little about cybercrime in general. How do cybercriminals decide what type of attacks or scams to run? Like, why would you go for banking trojans instead of ransomware? Well, the main thing that is driving, especially these crimeware, malware, criminals is money. They're going where the most potential money income is. If they see that, okay, ransomware is trending and I don't need to put that much effort to create my own ransomware, I have my distribution networks done then okay, I just push out this ransomware and the money is just flowing in. For banking trojans, it's pretty simple if you have good target banks that you know how to compromise. How do you intercept the bank transfers so that you can transfer a little bit of money to your own account as well? It's simple. They just go where the money flows. Yeah, and when one stream trickles down, you just move on to whatever's making more money now. Yeah, exactly. Tech's always changing and moves pretty quickly. Can the latest tech keep us safe from cybercrime? On the technical side, I'm not really worried at all. Why is that? I think we can keep up with those guys. What is really worrying me is kind of a blurring of these categories. I mean, is tricking someone with a love letter in in Facebook, is that cybercrime? I think it is. But that's clearly something that AB cannot do much about. By tech, you mean that... We can detect the latest viruses, malware like that, but if you can trick a human being, you're always going to be successful. Yes, yes, exactly. There's always going to be this kind of polarity that on the one side you have this high-tech cyber crime with complex technologies and zero days and whatnot. So this is what we traditionally have been kind of working on. But then on the other side, you just simply ask for money. If you ask million people money, someone will give you and you get rich. And that's cyber crime still. Absolutely. Not much you can do about stuff like that. What would be the, the thing to do to uh, sort of fix the human being part of the problem? Well, education. <laughs> yeah, education is pretty much the only way. We can share the knowledge we have and that way share the good security measures that anyone can do by themselves. There's actually been quite good progress in this, I think. We've been keep telling people that you have to do your updates, you have to make backups, you have to do this and that. And people are accepting that now. They are not like um, getting really pissed off when the computer is booting all the time because of updates and all that stuff that is happening. So I think that is paying off. So the security in operating systems is getting actually really good. I mean, the browsers and the core operating systems like Windows, it's really good. But it's the human that is clicking and and doing all that. That's still what we need to fix. But Yeah, let's talk about your work a little bit. What's it like to be a malware analyst? Like, what gives you your kicks in the work? Do you feel disappointed when the bad guys can't come up with anything cool? Do you dream of the next uh, Stuxnet? I'm not after this kind of uh, big media things, like big malware cases of uh, nation-state grade stuff. Of course, that would be nice, but for me, it's more like a generic curiosity that has been basically driving me. I actually still remember my first uh, real malware that I reversed. At that time, I was working for this um, major Finnish um, IT provider for networks and Unix servers. And we actually saw in one of the proxy logs these strange things going on. And there was this Windows executables coming into the network. And I just had to find out what it is doing. So I bought IDA license personally with my own money. Spent some weekends, some nights doing reversing and... And when I actually realized what it was doing, when finally everything starts to click, I guess that's the kind of feeling I'm still looking for. It's kind of, it's it's very exciting kind of thing. I get almost obsessive when I actually get into that sort of mode. So what about Pavi? What drives you? I need to agree with Jarko here that I'm not really waiting for these very big media things just to happen so that we can get fame and be part of something very big that's receiving a lot of interest, public interest. I'm in this line of work because I'm also very curious. And for analyzing malware, figuring out what it does and finding out where it came from and what was its purpose and why would the creator of this malware do these decisions that why would they want to target that? And uh, 
trying to understand their infrastructure behind it and basically understanding the whole picture is really giving me the kick that keeps me in this work. But if it's the the puzzles of it that are keeping you motivated, doesn't it get boring when you see the criminals just doing the same old thing over and over again and being madly successful in something that should absolutely not work at all? We also have other things to do. For example, I have another role in this company. I'm also being part of R&D for a long time. And so for me, it's basically two sides of things. One of the sides is this figure out what they do, how they work, how these things operate. But then I have the other angle, like what can we do about it with our technology? And that's basically something that never stops. So we can always perfect our tools and technologies and it's not going to get boring. One of the most fascinating parts of the work is to understand the whole picture that you get the puzzle pieces together. But we also need to think of solutions for fixing that. Whereas Jarko is in R&D, I'm more on the feed automation and trying to get more visibility in all the threats that are occurring. So we have even better coverage. So it's not only one cyber criminal gang that we're tracking, we're tracking everything. And our goal is to understand the whole picture and understand the trends. It doesn't matter that we see that, okay, these guys are doing the same things. And okay, now I'm seeing this guy doing the same thing again, but it's giving us information that, okay, this is trending. And this is giving us prioritization that what R&D is supposed to do to give better protection for our customers. Do you ever get mad at news when the Olympic destroyer pops up and people are saying, no, that's definitely China. And you're like, it absolutely isn't. Well, I don't get that strong emotions. I'm just like shaking my heads and wondering where did they figure out this attribution and they don't have strong enough proof, in my opinion, usually to state these arguments. But does it ever happen that you sort of, you see something, something new and you're like, okay, this is going to be big. Well, it happened for crypto checking for me. When I actually hit the pirate pay thing and saw the script, I was like, yes, this is going to hit. It was so obvious because it's so easy way to make money. And the JavaScript security model is basically non-existing. So you can put these third-party scripts from any site and they will run. So basically, that's what it's based on. So any last words, final advice for our listeners? For crypto checking, you better disable JavaScript. That's always sound advice. Thanks for being here today. Thanks. Thanks. That was the show today. I hope you enjoyed it. Please get in touch with us through Twitter with the hashtag Cybersauna with your feedback, comments and suggestions. Thanks for listening and be sure to subscribe. Stop clicking on things. Stop clicking on things. (laughs) (laughs) We're going to do a thing out of it for the Christmas special.